Your friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, your Heavenly Father, and from your Savior, Jesus. Amen. Uh, The text for our sermon today comes from the epistle reading, 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word. This year, 2017, is, um, is really kind of an amazing year for us. Of course, we all know it's the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation that started back uh, 1517 when Luther posted those famous 95 theses in Wittenberg. And it seems that the whole world this year is paying attention to, to Luther. It's like it's Luther 24-7-365. And the Reformation, to be honest, is a, is a pretty big deal, not just religiously, but, but culturally and politically. But there is even more to 2017. This year also marks, as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, our LWML, which has done so much to encourage and support the sharing of the gospel within our synod, and among our partners and friends throughout the world. And that's a pretty big deal, too. In the half century since the start of the Reformation, in the the 75 years since the founding of the LWML, confessing the faith hasn't gotten any easier. In some respects, it may even be harder for us to to speak and live as Christians today. And who knows what the future may hold for our, our children and grandchildren. Yet we know one thing. We know that God is faithful. We know that he has promised that his church will survive all the challenges that the devil, the world, and even our own sinful flesh can throw at us. Building on the promises of God, we know that this is our time to be distinctly Lutheran. Which is nothing more than our way of saying being nothing more than Christian. As confessing Lutherans in a rapidly changing world... And in an increasingly hostile culture, we need to be ready to confess the gospel of Jesus to a world that desperately needs to hear it. After the events of last Sunday in Texas, as well as the reaction of uh, many in the world and the media to it, is there any doubt that our world needs the gospel? But to be proclaimers of this message of salvation... This is central to our identity as God's people. As Paul wrote in the epistle lesson today, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. When St. Paul wrote those words to Timothy, he did so as one writing to a fellow pastor, a man who was specifically called to carry out the office of the holy ministry. And he did so knowing full well the challenges that faced preachers of the gospel in the early church's setting. But he also did so knowing that Timothy had come to faith through the Holy Spirit, working through the faithful teaching of a committed mother and grandmother. I am reminded of your sincere faith, he wrote. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. The good news of the gospel is given to each of us to share and to pass on with those whom God has placed in our sphere of influence, regardless of our station in life. Proclaiming the gospel is not just the pastor's job. Not all of us are pastors, but each one of us is called to confess the gospel as God opens up the doors for us to do so. You are called by God to be ready to confess. The need for sharing Jesus is as pronounced today as it's ever been. You know, we often hear about the uh, religious makeup of our country. Ninety percent of Americans claim to believe in God. And yet their understanding of the one true God is often far less than biblical. Add to that the fact that nearly upwards of 60% of of evangelical Christians, which which includes us, up to 60% think that there may be ways to salvation outside of Christ. 
That tells us something. The need to be ready to confess the message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, is pressing. As today as it's ever been. And then you add to that Paul's realistic assessment of where people were in his time. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Sounds like 2017, doesn't it? But not just 2017. Also, 1517, the setting in which God called Luther to confess Jesus was as easily as as confused and muddled as our own is. Worship of saints had intruded on the worship of the triune God. Works were preached as necessary for salvation in addition to trust in Christ. You had purgatory and and images and relics and all kinds of other aberrations that had, had obscured the gospel. Of salvation in Christ alone. And this context, of course, led to the unique character of the Lutheran Reformation. For Luther, as he read the New Testament, and especially what Paul wrote to the Romans, he was confronted by the question of righteousness. Exactly what does it mean to be right in God's eyes? And to Luther, the scriptures were clear, keep God's law perfectly. But Luther was an honest man. He knew that that was the one thing he did not do. Tried to make things right. He went to his priest continuously and confessed his sin. He he dredged up every thought, word, and deed from a lifetime of sin. He, He confessed it. Was conditionally forgiven. And then went out and tried to do some good works as satisfaction to to secure his forgiveness. But as Luther was busy, his mind would think of other things that he had done. And he realized that his confession was imperfect and insufficient, which was a requirement. And so that meant that the things that he were doing, they simply weren't enough. And finally, one day, his priest confronted him. Luther, he he said, it's not that God hates you. It's that you hate God. And the dam finally broke for Luther when when he understood through the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit working through the scriptures that that the righteousness of God is not about us being or becoming good enough. The righteousness of God is about Jesus who is perfect. Jesus, the God-man who has won salvation for Luther and for you and for me perfectly once and for all. There's a great exchange that occurs. Jesus took on himself the filthy rags of our sinfulness. And he carried them to the cross and crucified them once and for all. And then his righteousness, God, becomes our clothing in baptism. Where before there was a sinner, God now sees a perfectly redeemed individual because of Jesus. There is now a child of God, whereas before there had been a child of hell and wrath. God's righteousness is his work for us. And it's applied to us freely and completely because of Jesus. This, the biblical gospel, the only gospel, is what you and I have to be ready to confess. 1517, Luther didn't see all this clearly. It took a few years for him to work out all of the scriptural implications. But once he did, he was ready to confess, and he did, until 1546, the end of his life. Which brings up a question for us today. How do we, like Luther, prepare ourselves to be ready to confess? Today in particular, as we already noted, we we want to remember the work of the LWML. The LWML has had a marvelous impact on, on mission efforts of congregations in districts, in seminaries, and in all sorts of other entities of our synod. And it's done so always by carrying out faithfully its mission to assist each woman of the LCMS in affirming her relationship with the triune God so that she is enabled to use her gifts of ministry to the people of the world. You know, there's never a perfect time to start an organization like the LWML. LWML. 
But could there have been a more challenging time than 1942? The world had been at war for three years, and the U.S. had joined the, effort, the war effort just the year before. Rations were short. Many young and even older men were preparing to fight overseas. Women were entering the workforces to fulfill the, or fill the vacancies that were left by the soldiers. Those were challenging times. And yet in July of 42, over 100 women met in Chicago when they established the LWML. And its purpose was simple, to simply encourage a greater consciousness among women for missionary education, missionary inspiration, and missionary service. It also decided to, to gather funds for mission projects that were above and beyond the Synod's budget. And from that very small beginning, and through the use of those mite boxes that I gave the kids a moment ago, the League has blessed the mission efforts of our church. As we all know, time marches on. The older we get, the faster it seems to march. The Lutheran Confession has always struggled against the intrusion of, of false teaching in the spirit of the times. It faced the stormy religious wars of 1617, the rationalism of 1717, the pietism of 1817, the First World War of 1917. And today, in 2017, it faces challenges from postmodernism, post denominationalism, radical atheism, terrorism. But praise God, we're still here. The Lord has been faithful, raising up pastors like Timothy to preach the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins, raised for our justification, which overcomes the challenges of every age. And the Lord has gathered faithful men, women, and children who carried out the work of the Lord with zeal and with devotion, meeting the challenges and the opportunities to reach out to those people that need the gospel. Simply put, my friends, our God is faithful, and He keeps His promises. God is how we will be ready to confess. And we pray this Sunday and always that no matter the times or no matter the challenges, that he will enable us to be ready to confess. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard our hearts and our minds through faith in our Savior Jesus. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, please rise with me. Joyfully give, confess your faith is found in Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. The men may be seated at this time, and I will lead the ladies 